retired a while back and I went, what am I going to do with myself now? Since I'm on the government dole. So I thought, well, when I wore a younger man's clothes, I did some artistic things. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try something in that. So yeah, now that's what I'm doing is a botanical art. I press leaves and things and frame them up. So it's, it's this botanical and horticultural stuff is just an obsession. I just can't, can't help it, can't stop myself. <clears throat> I did this same program just a few weeks ago at the uh, Dallas Arboretum. And uh, it was down to, I think, um, about 22 degrees the night before. So it was definitely a, a timely, timely situation. Today we went to, I believe it was 82 degrees. So today, no worries. You'd had to, if you had a greenhouse, you had, had had that baby wide open to keep keep it cool. So anyway, uh, give you a little rundown. If you're not familiar with the Dallas County Master Gardeners, we are a volunteer arm of the Texas A&M Extension Service. Basically, we are part of an organization to give you information about all things horticultural. Some of the things that we do in the community, and this is just, this is probably less than 25% <clears throat> education programs we provide for master gardeners education. You can become a master gardener, just like people here are master composters. Um, we do have what's known as a help desk phone, and I'll, the phone number will be given to you at the end of the program. So if you ever need, have any questions about gardening, landscape, vegetables, composting, you name it, even pollination, you can get your, ans your questions answered by calling the help desk for the Dallas County Master Gardeners. And it's, that's Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30. It's hard to get those two guys that are on the radio. They're only on on Sunday morning, so if you miss them, you know, you're in trouble. But we, we, we've, got, uh, we've got the answers for you. Speakers Bureau, that's what I'm involved with. Dallas County uh, Community College has education programs. We, next weekend, we'll be at the Dallas Home and Garden Show. Coming up, we do programs at the Arboretum, Texas Discovery Garden at Fair Park. Uh, we have a fall tour, we have Earthkind stewardship programs, and then we have, this is just a small sampling of some of the demonstrations uh, and volunteer projects that we have. Today, we're going to talk about greenhouses, principally structures, materials, and equipment that would go into what you would require to get up from ground zero, what you'll need to put together a greenhouse or also a hoop house. You remember the movie uh, Crocodile Dundee? They, he and uh, uh, Linda Kozlowski, are out in the, in the park and they're accosted by some ruffians and the guy pulls out a switchblade knife and, and she says, he's got a knife. And he whips out his and goes, no, that's not a knife. No, that's a knife. Well, that's a greenhouse. Now that is a greenhouse, huh? But this is, these are more display things for people who are in, in uh, areas where you gotta conserve some tropical stuff, which we don't have that situation. But location. Now if I was positioning a greenhouse and I would live, still lived in the place I was born, which is northern Minnesota, I would really worry about positioning my greenhouse because even in, the farther north you go, the lower the sun in the winter. So you're getting less energy. Fortunately for us, we don't have that situation. So yeah, it's good to have a greenhouse in a position where you catch a lot of, of low exposure to the southern, so, south exposure to the winter sun, which would be in this area. But because 
we don't have the problem of really cold temperatures and we're not far north latitudes, not quite as important as if you were, you know, anybody born in the north? Anybody moved down here from Illinois, Michigan, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, New York. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it can be a little bit daunting. Uh, you know, when the, when the winter comes, everybody just kind of goes inside, landscape goes dormant. You can't even dig in the ground, ground's frozen, right? We never have, our ground temperature here rarely goes below 45. And my tap water, tap water, is running at about 66, 67 degrees. Not so if you live in the north. So if you've got some of these other exposures, not to worry so much because one, the winter sun is not gonna be as low as it is in the north. And two, anything outside, you're gonna have far more light than you're gonna have indoors. I mean, the difference is immense. Reason to have a greenhouse. Environmental control. You wanna start seeds, you wanna do plant propagation. You want to overwinter plants, okay? These are the principal reasons that you as a homeowner are gonna want a greenhouse. Greenhouse structures, oh, the, the variety is immense. And you've got a handout that's gonna go through and give you a lot of good pointers. And it's also gonna have a vast number of websites and information sites on the back page that are gonna give you all, I mean, you can spend days researching through these. I mean, there is no end, no limit to the information you can uh, make available. These are the standard types of greenhouses from lean-tos, quonsets, A-frames. I don't know what a tripenta is, never tried that one. That's this thing up here. <laughs> I don't know who does that. You can go high end. Uh, right after I did that program at the Arboretum, I had a call to do a consult to a house over in, in North Dallas, and this is their greenhouse. And that just shows the, the front end. It, it extends quite a bit to the back. It's a pretty extensive greenhouse. So you, you, know, it's, you can go pretty much the full gamut. Here's a kit type greenhouse, a freestanding. Also, they make it in a lean-to type. Very handy, very easy to erect and install. All you need is some kind of a foundation attachment to a, an existing shed or garage. This thing here, you definitely want to bolt that down because you know what would happen here during the spring, we get one of those blue northers come through. That greenhouse might be in the South 40. We got this type called Gothic Arch. That's definitely good if you're in the Northland with a lot of snow. That's gonna really shed the snow. Same with the slant side. Those are very good for, you know, bad weather conditions. As you can see, this is a metal frame, wood frame. Here's a, a really nifty little do-it-yourselfer. Use a screen door. They've got some fancy glass panels put in here. All wood construction, got their beds out here. Very nice setup. Here's one that's pretty straightforward. You can get plans online. You can, you know, they've got kits. Um, multitude of different opportunities for you. Now your materials, what kind of structure did you wanna, you know, use, what kind of materials to use to make your greenhouse? Steel or metal studs, you know, they, they in the big box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, you can purchase metal studs, things that they use to standard to build houses with. They're easy to deal with, lightweight. Aluminum's a little more expensive, a little harder to work with if you, if you have to do any cutting. Wood is probably the easiest, simplest. You've got a variety of different sizes and types. PVC and resin, resin is a, is a 
They've got some wood that has been uh, impregnated with plastic, so it's very uh, easy to, to, to work with like wood, but it, it doesn't you know, rot uh, as, as uh, some wood might do. You can do the custom, you can do it yourself, you can buy prefab kits. Um, selection is yours depending on how handy you are, what kind of money you want to spend, how much time you've got. Lots of choices. Here's a very nice unit. It's got forced heat, a fan system, uh, anodized aluminum, framing, all glass. Uh, plenty of good ventilation. Here's a, a simple lean-to style using poly uh, plastic film. Pretty basic there. Here's a fancy little one with uh, tiles and uh, s small but you know very nice with a heating system, fans, lots of storage. That's, a, that's the thing you've got to be, you know, you have to consider what you're going to be doing on an ongoing basis. Glass house, or a greenhouse covering materials. Glass, of course, is the oldest material we've uh, used for greenhouses. Can be damaged, of course, easily from hail. Uh, can be damaged if you have high winds and you blow out, the glass can be blown out, and it can, it'll break. Polycarbonate, which is known by the brand name Lexan, is very durable, very clear, and it, can, and it can last a long time. It is a little pricey, though. You also have acrylic and fiberglass. These are a little bit less desirable because they'll uh, degrade from ultraviolet light over a period of time. Solex is a proprietary product that's uh, made available. It's a diffused plastic product. And of course, polyethylene film for you know, either a greenhouse or a hoop house is, is very economical and very versatile. Here's the polycarbonate. Comes in a variety of types, double wall, single wall, triple wall very insulating fact type factor. Here's your Solex, which can be put into a, uh, it's pliable. Here's your plexiglass and your polyfilm. So what's best for you, depending on what kind of a greenhouse you want to put in. Flooring materials. You might not think about it too much, but flooring materials are really very important depending on whether you're going to have a permanent installation or a temporary installation. Because if you're, if you're living in Minnesota or Michigan, I guarantee you want a permanent installation. With us here, maybe not. You might be able to put it up in, say, 1st of November, take it down the end of uh, February, and put everything away. So, Foundation, you know, flooring is going to depend on how permanent of an installation you're, you want to deal with. Concrete. Concrete's very, very permanent. You can pour a pad, install your uprights and uh, structure into the concrete, make it very permanent. If you want to use brick pavers, as we saw in one of those other photographs, ease of use. Eventually, you want to pull them up. You want to you want to sell that house. Maybe you want to take it with you. The next people who come have no interest. Make it easy for them to get you know get back to the original concept. You can use plastic grid. We'll show you that in a photograph. P gravel, wood flooring. Wood flooring would be the type of uh, product like Trex. It's a um, uh, product that they fuse plastic and wood together so that it won't rot. You can use just black polyethylene flooring. Have you ever been to a, a um, nursery where you walk out and they've got all their shrubs and trees and everything out there and you're walking on this black 
fabric looking thing. Well, you can use that in a greenhouse. It's a very economical way to uh, keep weeds from coming up, but yet water will drain. And you may want to just use a, uh, you know, like a brick pavers or concrete just down the center, say in the walkways, and leave the other open, maybe with, with pea gravel. Here's, here's one of those typical examples. These are brick pavers that have been put down the center for the walkway. You have pea gravel on each side. You've got an area here that's for, for setting. You've got a water barrel for uh, gathering solar energy. Um, a uh, wash basin over here. You're shelving. Some kind of an electrical setup for lights and fans. This is uh, the uh, material used to contain the greenhouse is a double wall polycarbonate. So it's a very nice home greenhouse. Here's the rigid uh, plastic that you can use for flooring. Here's a flexible plastic grid. Here's the polypropylene fabric. And here it is again in a, in a different setup. Okay, your benching, you, you definitely are gonna have, wanna have benches. You may even wanna have an, a system set up for hanging baskets, you know, whatever it is that you want, some you know, floor space for larger plants, however you wanna do it. Um, it's gonna depend on what you're, what you're gonna wanna set up in the greenhouses as to what kind of system you're gonna wanna do. You can do wood glathing, wire grills, plastic, aluminum, Throw things down on the ground, whatever works. Here's wood lathing. This is called hardware cloth, which is a very open steel wire meshing. Here's your really fine mesh. You can even do tiered. You a lot of you know, cinder blocks are being used here to hold this up. This is a combination of wood and cinder blocks set up here. And underneath is that uh, poly <coughs> fabric. These are both large houses for you know from growers. What kind of setup do you want? You want back against the wall, jutting out. These are island type. These are for your more elaborate type of uh, greenhouse. Okay, for us in Texas. The most limiting factor is definitely going to be heat. Heat, humidity, what's called solar load. And so if you've got a greenhouse or a hoop house and you leave anything in it between you know, April and, and uh, October, uh, that greenhouse can get pretty hot. And so you're going to want a shade cloth, which is this material right here that's, that's draped over that uh, greenhouse to reduce the solar penetration. And you're going to want to have really good ventilation in the house if you're going to keep anything in there. And the cooling system is predominantly a passive type. It's called convective. That means you've got vents in the top of the house, vents in the bottom side where air just moves through it. Uh, vent fans are, are, um, are another excellent way. A fan and pad system, that's this thing here. Um, I did an internship with the uh, people out there at the A&M Research Center on Coit Road in the Turf Research Center. And this is what they had set up, which is very expensive. Water f filters through this and then air is drawn uh, in through that to cool the greenhouse. You can do a lesser program of that called a swamp cooler. The only problem you've got is humidity. Either one of these methods increases the humidity in the house. That's good news and bad news. You know, humidity increases some of the disease potential. But here's your, your passive type. Now these are, are uh, vent types that are made by manufacturers that have an automatic setting. In other words, there's a piston in here and that piston has oil in it and when the temperature hits a certain degree, let's say 85 degrees, it expands and opens that. So it's 
It's a passive automatic venting system. You don't have to do anything. There's no timers, no electronics, you know, nothing to do with that. Great item when you know, it gets too warm. You also have just plain louvered. They'll open up too, just when you, you know, heat, the heat generates enough airflow that the louvered type will just open up and, and air will pass out. But this is the, definitely the most effective if you've got a standard style of greenhouse. Uh, if you've got a hoop house, it's hard to, this is really a hard thing to have, so gable vents are an excellent item at the top of a, of a uh, hoop house. And we'll show you that too. Here's a swamp cooler, pulls air through these vents that has water running through a, a, a saturation material and then it blows the air into the greenhouse, that, known as a swamp cooler or evaporative cooler. Those are really great for West Texas, Arizona, New Mexico where the air is dry. For us, not quite as efficient, but you know, still good. And then of course, just a good heavy duty fan to pull air through if you've got a big house. Air circulation, this is just having fans in the greenhouse or fans in your hoop house. That house that I went on a consult with, they had some regular overhead fans, kind of like, a, 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 um, like you'd have in your house, but that was it, and they were not running, even in the winter, and this is very important. You need air circulating in a greenhouse or a hoop house, even in the winter, and the key here is because it reduces the potential for diseases and pests. 80% of all diseases of plants are fungus. And humidity levels can really get high in a greenhouse or a hoop house, especially in the winter. And in fact, this, the house I, that I went to visit, it was just, I mean, it was literally dripping on my head. There was so much condensation in there. <clears throat> and they had no fans going. Temperature was about 45 degrees in there, and they had some tropicals in there doing, everything was doing okay. But they were just, they were showing symptoms, several plants were showing symptoms of fungal disease. When it gets hot, the problems you've got are spider mites, aphids, white fly, and circulation can definitely reduce their numbers. You can get some of the uh, air movement via your cooling system, heating system, but you really want independent fans. I told I, when I'm after I'm just about ready to leave. I said, till I get finished working on what we're going to do with your house here, uh, I said two things you need to do, and one of them is you need to get get these fans moving. So air circulation is really a very important thing in a greenhouse set because you have that closed environment. Heating system. This is the kind of system we had out there at the uh, research center. Of course, your tax dollars at work, work they're going to spend, you know, I mean, they're going to spend plenty of good money on best systems they can. That big evaporative system they cool a house with, you know, that's uh, your tax dollars at work. But if, uh, if you don't have that opportunity, there are other ways you can keep your greenhouse uh, or hoop house warm. Uh, there are, of course, natural gas, propane, electric, solar, um, forced fans. Uh, you know, add the, sometimes they have a, a poly, what's known as a poly tube system, is there a tubular vent that comes out, off of the hot air and distributes that air evenly throughout the greenhouse so you don't have hot here, cold here. For us, we really don't have a lot of problems here. This year is probably the first year that we've had in a long time temperatures that have been a problem. This is, they say this is the ninth coldest winter that we've had since records have been kept. The last time I was here, I did a program on tomatoes, and uh, the uh, video on that was a friend who he planted his tomatoes mid-February. Well, the first 15 days of this month, it's been 
pretty cold. They, they would have killed him. Of course, he built the miniature greenhouse to go over that. And he was using his wife's space heaters out there and blowing his circuits. Because space heaters, they put out a lot of watts, you know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 watts. That's a lot of juice. You can, he, he was in East Dallas and was in a house that was probably built back in the 40s. So his circuit breakers just didn't want to handle that kind of load. But if you've got incandescent light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs, 98% of the energy that they put off is heat. He would have probably been better off to put a small fan out there and a couple of 150 watt light bulbs. That would have put out all the heat he wanted. And that's what I use. I'll take and put an extension cord and a shop light with a 100, 150 watt light bulb out there and that will generate enough heat to keep me well above freezing, keep me in the 40 or above range. So for your purposes in a greenhouse, you don't have to get really elaborate. The other thing too is we talk about solar. You can put in some uh, large containers, 10, 20, 30 gallon containers of water and in the wintertime, of course, you get, if you've got good sun exposure, that container, if it's a dark colored container, is gonna absorb a lot of energy. And then when the sun goes down, it's gonna give that energy back off. So you're gonna get a passive exchange of heat. Uh, also, you, you go on the internet and you'll find that there are people who have made solar heaters out of, take a box, paint it black, cover it with glass, I mean, just a thin box, like yay thick, about that big. They put a little fan on it and, and duct work, and the air coming out of that little box, that solar heater is you know, 150, 160 degrees. So there's a, you can go on the internet and find you know, these passive solar heating devices, very inexpensive. So there's a lot of different ways to heat your greenhouse. Irrigation. That can get pretty elaborate, especially in the commercial greenhouses. Boy, these, these people really go to some lengths in their irrigation systems to make sure that they get, you know, the right watering, right nutrients, etc., right pH. They control everything, down to the to parts per million. It's very exacting that they, you know, what they go through in a in a commercial greenhouse. For us, principally, it's going to be one of pretty much two things: you're going to hand water, or you're going to water. You know, have some pans there where you you put your trays, water it, and let it come up from the bottom. Um, if you want to, you can put in a drip system. Um, but if you're going to be there monitoring it, you know, the expense probably is not worth it. Supplemental lighting. Now this is something that uh, is going to be important if you're going to do seed propagation or propagation from cuttings. Probably going to be a little bit more important here. Um, You've got high pressure sodium and metal halide. Those are the type of systems that the people who live in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington use. You know what they're growing in, don't you? Yeah. They're, they're growing a very expensive cash crop. But for us, either compact fluorescent or tube fluorescent is gonna do very well for the money you're gonna get what's known as, in the, in the trade for uh, people who are in, involved with lighting, what you're looking for is lumens. The higher the lumens, the more light you're getting. And, and it, they rate it lumens per watt. So you have a 40 watt light bulb tube here, you got 40, you're gonna get very good lumens per watt in a fluorescent tube. Even to, to a certain degree in a fluorescent, uh, compact fluorescent. Uh, 
if you're really going to bring it down close to your plant that you're propagating. And that's the key is you're going to be very, very close. You're not going to have something like this 10 feet off the ground. It's going to be right down there on top of that plant. And of course, fluorescent doesn't put out a lot of heat. In fact, it puts out practically nothing at all. So you're no worries. You can really get it down low. And that's the critical item. <clears throat> For the most part, um, you're going to enhance photosynthesis. And the key here is duration. You're going to, especially now, between October and April, the amount of sunlight is reduced. So you turn this on, you put it on a timer, and you let it run until midnight, 1 o'clock. Because you're tricking the plant. You want it to have lot of light duration that's going to make up for light intensity. So a lot of times duration will trump intensity. Uh, control the photo period. Well, that's if you're growing something like poinsettias, you, you know, that's something you'd be worried about is, is controlling the photo period or maybe Christmas cactus, Thanksgiving cactus. You're trying to cultivate a specific type of plant to bloom at a certain time. But the key here is probably just going to be your standard fluorescent tube type light fixture and maybe a little supplement with the uh, maybe a compact fluorescent and you use one of these clip-on dome type lights that you can really get down close to an item. And these can be put on a, on a simple $10 timer that you'd pick up at a, at a big box store. You can get pretty fancy with environmental controls and you know, people who are really into it, well, you know, they can, you know, especially in the commercial people. You know, thermostats, digital controllers, et cetera, it can be very extensive. But I think for the home uh, greenhouse uh, person, you're going you're gonna to be working on things that are a little simpler. And I brought one of those things along today. <clears throat> This is one of those items that you can purchase just about anywhere, big box store, whatever. It is a remote, battery operated remote, and a base unit. And these come in a variety of different types. Some of them have clocks and so forth. I think atomic clock is one of them. Most of them have a base and a, and a, a remote unit. You put this unit in your greenhouse, and you put your base somewhere where it's easy and convenient in the house, and it gives you the reading, temperature reading in the house and the temperature reading outside at your remote, which is inside your greenhouse. You can get another one, set it up, put one, put, a, put one of them outside so it tells you what's my outside temperature, what's my greenhouse temperature. You can even get them to, so you can set up an alarm would go off if the temperature drops too low or in a preset that you, you come up with. So maybe it's 40 degrees or 35 degrees. So real easy to monitor the temperature in your greenhouse in a very inexpensive way. These things run like $10, $15. The atomic clock, they go up to about $25. Water treatment systems. Again, very, you can get as elaborate as you want to with the uh, reverse osmosis to clean your water. Our water, for the most part here, is fairly high pH and fairly high calcium levels. So the only thing we would be concerned with is that pH if you're growing plants that like more acidic conditions. There you'd want to treat your water, do a little hand watering. Maybe you'd add some vinegar to the water <laughs> to reduce the pH. Um, Commercial people will use an, actually an acid injection system to, to control pH. Fertilizing is a pretty, in, pretty convenient way. You mix up your fertilizer in a, in a siphon, a uh, hose siphon, and you water it directly if you're going to do a large application. Otherwise, you just throw it on a little, some granular or some organic, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Additional considerations, depending on how elaborate you're going to go. 
If you're going to put in a permanent greenhouse, you know, an underground electrical circuit, uh, uh, exterior circuit is, and, and wiring would be a very good item. You want to have close proximity to water. You want to have some kind of access so that you can easily move potting soil, containers, etc., to and from. If you if your greenhouse is solely used for plants, then you're going to have want to have some area, a potting shed, a potting bench, whatever. Staging area, maybe that's another. Maybe you have a shed where you store all your stuff, your chemicals, etc. Maybe you put in a sink or a basin inside or outside. You want to do rainwater harvesting? Not a bad idea. Rainwater is excellent for the greenhouse. You want to do water recycling, That's, these are some of the additional benefits and things that you might be interested in considering when you do your greenhouse. So you definitely want to do some research. And you want to get creative. Now we're going to talk about our next item is hoop house. Now cost-wise, these can be a very inexpensive alternative to the standard greenhouse. As you can see here, um, polyfilm over a Quonset hut type style setup here. It's mostly a wood, wood setup. Here's your high ventilation at the, uh, at the ends. I'm probably even put another ventilating uh, opening up here at the very top. Nice, nice size. You do a lot in there. Consideration for insulation. A lot of the uh, uh, greenhouses that I've worked with over at Richland College and Naaman Forest High School, they have supplements to their greenhouses in these large poly houses. <clears throat> and what they do to increase the insulation is you have two layers of polyfilm, one on top of another. And then they take this device here, which is a blower, and mount it on the inside. And then, then the fan blows air between the two envelopes and raises that. Well, air, dead air, is a very good insulator. So that's a one way to increase the efficiency as far as a hoop house is concerned for insulating value without having to get very expensive. Uh, and you'd want to use somewhere between four millimeter, six millimeter plastic. That's one alternative uh, to increasing your, your efficiency of a, it's called a double wall blower. And they, in some of the cases they'll put, they'll even have a shade cloth as part of that combination. It, that's going to the high end. You go to a big box store and you go, um, I'm looking for some stuff I can use to make greenhouse. I want some, you know, some, you know, no, we don't have nothing like that. No, we don't, we don't do that. Sure they do. What we're doing right here, this pipe that we're bending is this pipe right here. It's that top rail of a chain link fence. That's all that is. And that's being bent. You can use metal conduit for electrical, bend that. You can use PVC. So, I mean, they've got it. It's just that they're not thinking in that, in that direction as to that being used for that consideration. Because if you went to try to buy something specifically made, that'd be too expensive. But these things are, are pretty inexpensive. And they're not too thick. They're relatively easy to bend. So you're going to make, you make a hoop house, you can make it a big one using these um, lateral uh, chain link fence top. Here's one made with wood framing on the edges and PVC in hoops. Uh, I probably would have reinforced this with a, another lateral piece in here. Uh, but this is a very inexpensive, easy to make. You know, you, you want to uh, 
ventilate this, you just open the door. They have, have access on either end. So again, you, you want to store plants, you want to do a little early propagation, get some tomatoes, peppers, and, and other vegetables up and running. An easy to do yourself project. And here's another setup. This is called Flower House Spring House. Uh, you familiar with the item that you buy at the store that you put in the windshield of your vehicle, they got those two hoops, and you take it down, fold it over, and then you do a little twist number and it compresses down into a size about that big. And then you let it go and it pops back up. It has this thing called memory steel. That's what this thing is right here. Those, those are those memory steel hoops. And it will compact down into a, a bag about, well, half the size of this. And of course, when you fold it over and then twist it around, you can take that at the end of the season, say in March, when you're finished, take it down, fold it up, hang it up in your garage, that's it. And you can use it. I mean, they make them, this is an eight by eight shown, but they make them even larger, larger than that. Here's one where it's the metal frame is, is, is just put together. You just slide the little metal frame pieces together. Again, it's covered with a uh, plastic, it's got a zip out door. Very inexpensive, quick, easy. If you wanna just get started, see, well, I'm, let me test this out. Do I want to, um, do I want to do a greenhouse? Have I, have I got the time and the patience? Do I, do I want to go that route? Start off, you know, with one of these. Might be the, just the trick. This is the greenhouse out there at, uh, at Fort Worth where we were bending that pipe. This is one of the hoop houses that they had there. This is a evaporative swamp cooler. As you can see, it's plugged in here. It sucks the air in through the uh, vents here. Water is saturated into the a, uh, membrane behind this. And as the air is pulled across that, it, and it's pushed into the greenhouse to cool it. Right, they got a nice setup here. A lot, they even got their own meter running. You know, dedicated cost situation. Um, this house here is a kit from a company that produces the type of material, a diffused material called Solex. Here you've got a, a product called, it's known as Easy Up, E-Z-U-U-P, Easy Up. All they do here is they sell either plastic or metal brackets, those are these brackets at these points and you just install two by two and you can make this style, this style, that style, cover it with whatever material you want to. And I think these run somewhere in the around 30 to $45 for these brackets. If you want to, you could turn this one into a lean-to and make it even longer than it is. You could use it in a shorter version just as a, a miniature house. You know, just to, on a raised bed, you're just getting things up for their, say, from, oh, mid-February to the end of March. And then it's take it off and, you know, put it away. There's a lot of options here. This is another alternative. You got a lot of different retail products out there. <clears throat> Here's your ventilation here, zip door. Also ventilation here is a, a plastic coated metal. You've got a nice little lean-to just for out behind the, behind the house. Again, you stick a 60, 100 watt bulb in there on a cold night and that'll keep it real nice and warm. You wanna go on the internet? Oh boy. You can spend a day looking at this stuff, and I've got it, I've got resources for you. There's a night. There's there's two in San Antonio and one in Fort Worth that produce some very nice greenhouses. So I mean, if even if you wanted to go pick up pick it up yourself, save some shipping costs, 
you know, there's, there's people local. Here's a nifty little item, a kind of a hybrid mini. You put a 60 watt bulb underneath here and close that thing down, <coughs> keep it all warm right from underneath. So this would be an, a starter piece. Um, seed starters and cold frames are another option that you can deal with. On this one, you know, if, it, if you need heat, you might put just a standard heating pad, something that you'd buy at CVS. You just gotta make sure that you've got it covered uh, with plastic and you've got it on a, uh, one of these surge protectors, just in case. Another way to heat um, a small area like this is if you have manure compost in a plastic bag. Manure, especially if it's fresh and is moist, bacteria will generate heat. You know, compost, you master composters, you gotta have a volume of about a cubic yard of standard material to generate enough heat. But on manure compost, you know, a one or two cubic ba foot bag will generate a tremendous amount of heat if it, you know, if you can get the microbes working. So you put that down underneath and put a tray of, of uh, you know, flowers or vegetables on there and that'll keep it warm. A couple of milk jugs in there with water, again, for solar load. You can heat up uh, a small space very easily. The other thing to do is, of course, is read up. Uh, and there's a lot of books on the subject, as well as, of course, the internet. This is ortho all about greenhouses. This is uh, a good one, the greenhouse expert. Um, they'll give you all the details you want. And then you wanna get, get some help. This is my helper. <laughs> it's my grand, granddaughter, she's, she's my helper. Um, Aggie horticulture, and this is on your handout, on the back of your handout, it's got all of this information. But they've got, on their website, they've got everything about structures, heating, pH, fertilizing, irrigating, nutrients, deficient, everything you want to know. And they, this is very extensive because they do a lot of work with commercial greenhouse growers, a lot of research. So the nice thing here is you're going to benefit from a lot of this research and work that they've done for the, for the trade, and it's, it's available to you, free. So I would definitely take advantage of this. <clears throat> and then enjoy, because remember, you're gonna have to definitely get your plants out of that, out of your house by the time this hits, because most, most plants are going to go into heat stress above 85 degrees. And I'll tell you what, I go into heat stress above 85 degrees, so I don't want to be in that greenhouse in the summer either. Okay, questions? There's your phone number for the Dallas County Master Gardeners, and that's on your handout too. So if you ever have questions about any of the information you've seen here, any other, any other questions about horticulture, we're here to help you. And that's my presentation, I appreciate it.